During the present time, like that of David's exile, there are those who follow Jesus at the risk of their lives. This may sound melodramatic to those of us who live in conditions of security and comfort. However, around the world, Christ's loyalists suffer persecution and martyrdom, and there is never any guarantee that such will not break out without notice wherever Christians currently live in peace. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. None of David's men, as far as we know, were actually killed in their years of loyalty to the persecuted king, but they were willingly facing that prospect daily. As David said to Jonathan, There is but a step between me and death. For all we know, it is the same for all who enroll in Christ's service in the present hostile world. This is the vocation to which the gospel calls men and women, to live, to endure hardship, to brave persecution, and possibly to die for the love of God's appointed king. When David rose to universal power, he brought to power with him those who had been loyal to him in his exile. Similarly, the day will come when all recognize Jesus as king. Every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess him as Lord. At that time, those who already recognize him as the true king and have suffered for their loyalty to him during this phase of his kingship will rule with him in his universal reign. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. 2 Timothy 2 verse 12 The Throne in the Apocalypse The Apostle John was caught up in a vision from the prison island of Patmos, where he was incarcerated, into the heavenly realms. There he was permitted to view the workings of certain historical developments from a vantage point behind the scenes, and to see the divine purposes that lay beyond the events occurring on the world's stage. When caught up, the first thing that dominated his view was the throne of God, the sovereign of the universe. The image of the throne dominates the book of Revelation, being mentioned 34 times throughout the book. In the remainder of the New Testament books combined, the word throne occurs less than half that number of times. The apocalypse thus places deliberate stress upon the sovereignty of the heavens over events on earth. In Revelation, God is always seen to be on the throne, which is sometimes also called the throne of God and the Lamb. Revelation 22, verse 1 and verse 3. Thus, Christ is also reigning there. In Revelation 3.21, Jesus says to the church of Laodicea, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. In this statement, Jesus declares that he is currently enthroned with his father as the reward of his having overcome, a conquest that is elsewhere said to have been accomplished at the time of his death. John's vision of Christ enthroned is accompanied by further visions depicting specific actions that proceed from the throne, behind the scenes, impacting historical events. Consequently, the book of Revelation, whatever else it may be telling us, is emphatically declaring that the great national powers that rise, that engage in battles, that persecute believers, and that fall under God's judgment, all carry out their activities under the overarching purposes of the sovereignty of God and of Christ. Christ's sovereignty over the planet and its petty rulers is affirmed in the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords, which is repeatedly used of him, Revelation 17, verse 14, and Revelation 19, verse 16. This need not be taken to mean that humans have no free will, or that every occurrence on earth is directly decreed to happen by Christ in heaven. It does mean, however, that nothing can happen on earth if Christ does not at least allow it to take place. The fact that he gives limited power to men and women to choose their courses, even to the detriment of themselves and others, does not mean that he has surrendered his option of vetoing any outcome that they may pursue contrary to his will. God has an overarching purpose in history, which Christ is carrying out from heaven. No power on earth, including the devil, as we shall see in our next chapter, can even hope to thwart it. Meanwhile, back on earth. In the meantime, Christ mediates from heaven, 
God's rule over the earth through a kingdom comprised of his subjects in both heaven and earth. Some have now died and are gone to heaven, but they will return to earth when he does to take their places among the glorified saints inhabiting the renewed earth. Heaven is no permanent home for mankind, as the psalmist declares. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. Since Christ is the Son of Man, reigning over the sons of men, the restored earth is the rightful venue for his kingdom in its final phase. Like the servants in the parable, our instructions in the king's absence are, Occupy until I come. This is not merely a vague charge, meaning, find something useful to do while I am gone. As we shall see, our occupation is a wartime engagement. In his absence, the king's enemies are to be subdued and brought under his feet. That is the task left for us to accomplish in his absence, and no one said it would be easy.